I thought we would kick off with um, a reading, but not by the author, <laughs> by the audience members. I thought, thought we could sort of warm up the room up a bit by hearing, having your voices as well. So those of you who have received a piece of paper, you may be wondering if you haven't yet um, got a copy of the book in your hands, what it's all about. <laughs> well, these are all... Actually, I won't set it up. I think, Megan, if you want to kick it off with the title and read the first. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So this, these are all from the first story, the opening of the collection, um, titled A Catalog of Kanaka Superstitions, as told by your mother. And I'll... I'll just start. I have number one, actually. And then if everyone wants to go in order, um, that would be great. Don't sleep with your feet by the door. Those dangling, dreaming toes are sweet as sucrose to the night marchers, and they will drag you from your slumber by your feet. Don't sleep with your head under the open window. When the demon visits, he will wedge his knife through the slit and slice you open by the neck. Don't drive over the pile with fork in your car. The spirits of Kamakua and Pele will kindle a war in that tinderbox you call ahead, leave you with the ashes of lifelong bad luck scattered over your mushy brain bits. Don't sell your boat with bananas. You'll flounder along the seas with more bad luck, and of course, no more fish for you. Don't smash Mo with your rubber slipper. That's our Mika. Every dead relative who hasn't passed over confined to the wet elastic limbs of the house gecko. Could be Cousin Jerry, he died last year, or Molokai, Grandma, or your father. Don't kill the moth, could also be your father. <laughs> <laughs> Don't give your sister a close flower lay. She's a pie, you know, due in just a few weeks, and if you close her womb like that, the baby will slip from her legs before it's ready, choking on its own fork. Don't bury those chopsticks in your rice. That's how we left the chopsticks at your dad's funeral. All straight up like that. Bad luck. Don't whistle at night. You know what happens if the night marchers hear you? You know how fast they'll climb over the koalaus just to whittle down your spirit? You'll have to put everything you've got into evading them, should you hope to whistle and live. My baby, honey girl, don't you want to live? Don't stack those dishes like that. Four is a rotten number. You know that kanji for she is the same kanji for death. How much money we spent on your Japanese lessons and still you make mistakes. You should study longer, work harder, learn our language, practice your penmanship, do good, make your father proud. After everything that has happened to us, don't you want to make your father proud? What was that? Sorry. <laughs> oh, number 10. Okay, sorry, I love it. Uh, don't stand between your sister and her husband like that. You're not their kid, and anyway, you standing in the middle like that means you'll be the first to die. You like make dead die? What would I do without my baby? I can't live without you, my baby. Don't pinch your nose like that. That smell is only fresh flowers, a flute of music in our mouth. No matter that we don't keep flowers here, the smell stay from the other side. The rush of pluck iruma, sweet pucker of Kawake McKinney. Don't you know these are the fragrances of your father? The spirit is paying us a visit. Finally. Don't point at your father's headstone like that. His soul should be at peace, not summoned by the strength of your baby finger. You think he wants to be anywhere near this place? Leave him be. Let him sleep. Give yourself a Thank round of applause, you. please. <laughs> Thank you for reading. Mm -hmm. Right, and uh, Megan, you wanted to read a little bit from the story that follows. Absolutely. Is there anything else that you wanted to add before you dive in? Probably just thank you. That was so <laughs> beautiful, and I'm so overcome. That was such a special way to begin. So thank you, and thank you, Mimi, for setting that up. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'll just start with um, a short reading from the story that follows. Um, it's the titular story um, titled Every Drop is a Man's Nightmare. The first and only time she travels over the old Pully Road with a container of pork, Sadie smears blood on the back seat of her parents' car. It's well past midnight, and the stretch of old Pully descends into darkness as they travel the bends of the mighty Koolaus. 
Sadie's stepfather, Lopaka, is behind the wheel. Her mother, Kahea, a skeletal squirm of a woman taking up space in the front seat. They are fleeing the rural shadows of Ka'aava for Palolo, where they have a cottage, an unkempt backyard, and civilization to confront. Light posts splash a weak gloss on the asphalt, and with only a few cars traveling the roads, Lopaka pressures the gas pedal, wedging himself into speed as a cat nestles in tight spaces. Sadie has just gotten her period for the first time. She uses the hem of her new dress as a rag to sop the blood. As they veer down the pulley, Lopaka rolls down the windows, gusts whistling old tunes through the old Nissan, her mother's car, though Lopaka insists on driving. The wind flutters against the glass windows. Swaths of dark clouds migrate slowly over the ridge line. The road steers around the pulley peaks, deprived of their pristine emerald sheen under the intensity of night. Sadie sees the seat drenched in the same darkness. She skims two fingers over the wet lip of her underwear and brings them to her nose, inhaling a whiff of blood so sharp she bears her head out the window. I'm dying, she is convinced. I'm going to die on the island's most haunted road, tearing over ancestor bones like they are nothing. Lopaka calls from the front seat, eyeing her horrified reflection in the rearview mirror. Hey, what you doing back there, girl? The car rolls down the Nu'uanupali tunnel that braids through the ridgeline, weak yellowed light blinking through the dark just long enough for Sadie to see the blotches that have soaked the back seat, a deep burgundy beetling through the otherwise gray nylon. I'm bleeding, she says, too quiet at first. The car rattles through the end of the tunnel, emerging onto the tree-lined highway. Lopaka says, say that again? And Kahea says, just let it go for now. And Lopaka snaps back, girl needs to learn how to speak up. No one can hear a damn thing, she says. And Sadie sniffs her hand and says to her mother, I'm bleeding. She leans forward, presenting her stained fingers. Kahea glances at the blood, which by now has cemented into crimson arching her cuticles. She looks at Sadie with a flash of remorse, and then she is grinning. Oh, honey, it's about time. Sadie is 12 years old. Sadie feels around her underwear, and they are tearing over potholes and poorly paved road, going 70, 75, 80, 82, when a small figure emerges, straddling the lane divider toward which the car is gunning, and Lopaka slams on the brakes. Their bodies hurtling into the seat belt, screeching. Someone is screaming. Steam skims the asphalt, choking the car's shell. The car is not moving. The, per the person screeching stops screeching, goes quiet. They all go quiet. Sadie peers through the kicked-up dust, scans the dark road, spies a creature the size of a, a cat, maybe? Or perhaps an overweight mongoose, something that snips and snarls, but to its core deeply fears you. She squints into the dark and sees a wild pua'a hunched low to the ground, its bristly tail and charcoal snout accentuated by the car's high beams, which Lopaka flashes and flashes, and Kahea whispers, My God and then Sadie draws a breath at the sheen of blood she senses on its black coat. She stares at her fingers, sees the same blood. Fucking rodent, Lopaka says, shifting the car back into drive and maneuvering around the wild boar, bleeding or covered in blood, or both. Hunting season can't come soon enough. But Sadie would like nothing more than to rescue every single pua'a, including the bleeding one, which she knows for certain her new step family would ensnare instantly with their arcane muzzle loaders and hunting rifles. As the car propels forward, Sadie glances back at what she's just lost a pua'a standing firm on its quarters, painted in ribbons of blooming burgundy, wagging its weedy tail like a pup that's been torn from its mother. She watches the pua'a until its outline bleeds into the stretch of haunted highway fading in their wake. I'll stop there. Thank you. So, um, Megan, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm fine. You've been, this is your first book. Yes. And tell us how long you've spent write, working on these stories. Yeah. I, so, the, so the majority of the stories in this collection I have was working on for about four years. Um, a few other, a couple of the stories I had started earlier uh, the earliest story is Temporary Dwellers, um, and that story I actually began in uh, 2015. Um, so I think, yeah, the range is a little wide. <laughs> yeah. 
And how long have you been on the road? Uh, this will be the 10th day, day 10. Mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then this is your last This is. Event, and then you go home. Yeah. Okay. So thank you all for coming. <laughs> so this sounds like a pretty accurate um, description of the ri- writing life, right? Yeah. You spend about seven years <laughs> in a room and then about 10 days just going, events, events, interviews, yeah. interviews, and all that stuff. So it's yeah. like... Roller coaster. Okay, and then well, home. Yeah. And then <laughs> home. I hope you get a good night's rest <laughs> when you get there. Um, so uh, I wanted to start off by talking about, well, we started with superstitions and the ancestral heritage. Um, as people were reading, uh, beautifully, I might add, um, I thought I kept thinking of the joke. I can't remember who wrote this, but the joke was, tradition is peer pressure from dead people <laughs> and um and so with that in mind <laughs> i was wondering how you uh how you worked with questions of ancestral cultural inheritance in these stories um that's so rooted in hawaiian culture and um and and how you approached the responsibility towards these but also I sense a lot of playfulness and how mm-hmm. you approach these too I know that in a later story I call the writer this um the idea of um the the idea of writing irresponsibly <laughs> about mm-hmm. this is explored as well so I just yeah. wanted to start off with that with that question yeah um that's a great question I think that's so much of what I was thinking about while writing these stories and sort of wrestling with for, for the years that I was working on them. Um, especially in terms of sort of writing responsibly of our stories, our mo'olalo in, in Olalo Hawaii. It's sort of the stories and myths and legends that kind of make up our culture and our history. And there, I had a lot of anxiety around exploring them in fiction. Um, I think which was rooted in so many things. And I think especially just this idea of having to do right by these ancestral stories and also by the, the living readers who are interacting with the stories today. And that pressure really kind of made the writing process for many years really hard. And I think it, um, it took me several years and many, many bad stories to even write a story that was set in Hawaii and sort of even explored just a single facet of what it, of what my own experience of, of being a native Hawaiian looked like. Um, and I think just that was actually temporary dwellers. And that was the story that I was sort of an access, um, entrance point for me. But I think so much of what I've learned about writing ancestral tales is sort of starting with that intentionality and, and really being intentional about having a commitment and, and seeing through a commitment of writing the truest version of, of these ancestral stories that feels true to me and to my experience. Um, I also took a lot of comfort in the idea of cultural mythology and sort of folklore and writing folklore as being sort of a, a communal act where when we think about sort of the, the stories and Hawaiian language that originated as an oral language, so many of these tales were exchanged orally and kind of there was never, this is one single iteration of a story and this is the truest form, you know. The stories always kind of changed just ever so slightly depending on who was telling them. And I took a lot of comfort in that and this sense of, mythology and and cultural stories especially as being sort of capacious and inviting and inviting not only my my truest version but also the opportunity to incorporate some of my interests and like writing obsessions Mm -hmm. um into them and I and I yeah I think that was um that was important for me to to learn in order to kind of even just build confidence in, in writing these tales yeah and where were you when you wrote temporary dwellers I was I was back home. I was in Honolulu. Yeah. 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 I had just um, graduated from undergrad and I Mm -hmm. spent all four years of undergraduate um, studies not writing stories 
in Hawaii. I wrote stories in places that I had ne- set in places that I had never been or been once, you know? Yeah. yeah. I, w- I asked that question because for me, I found that I, I can't write about a place until after I've left it mm-hmm. and just see it differently. I yeah. couldn't write about growing up Chinese in Britain until I'd left Britain. I couldn't write about being in, um, in Hong Kong or write yeah. about Hong Kong until after I'd left it. Or, you know, I wrote some bad poems about yeah. my grandma's, but, you know, <laughs> I don't really count those. So I was just really curious, and it, seemed, it makes so much sense that, you know, having some distance from those influences, as rich as they are, they can also feel quite anxiety yeah. and yeah. So present. Yeah. 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 Um, so uh, did you want to talk about Aiko, the writer? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell, tell us about the story. Um, this is a story... Um, it's one of the longer stories in the collection and it's sort of um it has kind of a longer history uh, beyond what's sort of in the collection today but essentially the story began after many many failed attempts at trying to write a story about the night marchers in in Hawaii and sort of what it looked like um the the night marchers as we understand it is sort of the the spirits of um, Hawaiian warriors that have passed and they're sort of protecting sacred spaces. And the stories of the night marchers are so ubiquitous in Hawaii, but they aren't very familiar, at least as I've encountered them um, elsewhere. And I felt like when we were putting, when I was working on this collection and had been working with uh, my agent, Eva Lani, um, who's amazing. Her sister's here tonight too. Sorry, that was super cool, but I was really excited to meet her. <laughs> um, and Evelyn was just an amazing editorial partner through the, the creation of this collection. And I think we both were talking about how the collection didn't feel complete without a Night Marcher story, mm-hmm. but I had tried written a lot of Night Marcher stories and they were, s- I, I did not like them at all. They felt very false and flat to me and I couldn't figure out what was what was wrong, what I, what I wasn't able to sort of get past. And, uh, the only way that I felt like I was able to access the night marchers mythology was by, with this sort of meta entry point of writing about a writer, a short story writer who was also wrestling with writing about night marchers. (laughs) Was just speaking in Austin, Texas. (laughs) Um, and, trying to kind of write into her experience of writing the story irresponsibly and Mm -hmm. not really heeding the advice from her, her grams, her um, ancestors and this sense of responsibility that she kind of just cast aside. And it felt like the only story that it felt so necessary to write. And I felt so much relief after writing it and I think it was it was still very hard, but it felt like the only way that I could access something in order to to tell the night marchers truthfully. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and it's so much more interesting than writing about characters who make good, healthy choices mm-hmm. all the time, right? So, um, so we've talked a bit about cultural inheritance, but that's just one aspect. That's why even through the stories, mm-hmm. you you've um, women's and girls bodies coming of age and the both the specter and the very real presence of colonization and also um, many other themes uh, uh, intertwine thematically um, throughout the collection and I'm curious if so you've talked a little bit about how with um with Aiko the writer how you you knew that you or you felt that you wanted to write a story with the night marches Mm -hmm. featuring heavily into it and I'm wondering with the other stories how they emerged did the themes emerge from the stories in some cases or did the stories emerge from you knowing that you wanted to tackle certain topics or themes I think that I have a sense that the theme sort of emerged almost out of character and following the actions and decisions that these characters were making. I, with fiction, I feel like a lot of what I've been learning with writing has been about sort of letting go as opposed to trying to control, tightly control a narrative. And 
some of my favorite stories that I've written have only come about as a result of kind of letting letting go of that control and really following a character or a set of characters and letting the impulses sort of just letting them guide the story a little bit um and I think that that in that process, then a lot of themes sort of started to creep up and reveal themselves to me. Um, but I just point that all back to, yeah, following characters, especially as they're making, like you mentioned, not the great, the best decisions or sort of messy decisions and, and just letting them kind of be who they need to be. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, I just wanted to mention that there will be a Q&A section at the very end and then Megan will be signing books. So, um, and we're going to keep the program really tight and, uh, <laughs> tight and juicy. Okay, so, um, so I want to talk about some things I know about Elvis mm. because um, I feel like we were kind of tele pathically kind of connecting we talked we on the phone uh before megan came out here and i said you know that story really st stood out to me because it's one of the few ones that didn't have a, a direct reference a presence of anything supernatural or myth-based it was just two people in a bar talking about a bunch of elvis mm -hmm. impersonators or tribute acts um whatever the the desired term is these days and and the reason why that story stuck, struck out to me because, was because even though it had this absence of those elements, it felt the most mysterious story to me. And it had this kind of uh, concision. Is it conciseness or concision? Sure, I feel like. Concision, nice. okay. So, um, and, uh, and so I wondered, well, actually, if you wouldn't mind reading a little bit from the story, and then I'll bombard yeah. you with questions about it definitely directly after yes okay. <laughs> yeah this was fun I got to read this story almost in its entirety in this weekend in Austin and it was so different from the experience of reading I've been reading a lot of sort of the earlier stories in the collection and like you said there's a lot of it's different so yeah I'll just read the beginning so this story is called some things I know about Elvis there were many instances when I should have paid closer attention to signs, but never more so than when I found myself lost in the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. I tell this to Sarah. We are sitting at a bar without a name, and I'm trying to get her to come home with me. She asks what was so wrong with being stranded in the Pink Lady, and I tell her there was an Elvis Presley impersonator guarding the entrance, asking passers-by for a cigarette. I don't understand, she says, and I try to explain myself, but then our drinks arrive. Tangray and tonic for Sarah, a leaking margarita on the rocks for me. We prop our elbows on the sticky vinyl bar top, not looking at each other. The stools are peeling chrome, no back support. The leaking is sour, like a burst blood vessel in my throat. Always I am thinking of local kind tidbits to share with Sarah, but Sarah isn't interested. She comes here every summer, brings her kanaka hair into the same mo'ili'ili bar in search of a good time. They treat her like Ohana here, and I am supremely jealous. Sarah's got the blood, even though I've lived here in Hawaii all my life. The bar is feathered with dark wood, wet lacquer floors, fringed antique furniture. We meet here every summer like old friends, even though neither of his, even though neither of us is all that old, and Sarah isn't very friendly. It began five years prior at my invitation, and despite our questionable chemistry and really not having all that much to talk about. We've maintained the tradition ever since. She's so quiet and interior, this Sarah. I try to peel back her reservations gradually so as not to spook her off. I tell Sarah the whole thing started because I was looking for someone to love, but she wants to know more about the Elvis Presley impersonator. Bad breath, cigarette breath, though he seemed to be having trouble procuring one. Her face scrunches in confusion. I don't see the problem. Do you hate Elvis or something? This proves a difficult question to answer, so instead I press on. Lucky for him, I show up. I always keep a pack of cools in any purse I carry, and to taunt her, I pull out a pack from the back pocket of my denim tote, leave it charged on the bar top between us. My father smoked those, Sarah muses. I smile. So anyway, I give him a cigarette, right? 
But instead of asking me for a light, he goes and turns to the guy to his right, and you'll never believe it. What? That guy was an Elvis Presley impersonator, too. And the guy next to him, and the guy behind him. The Presleys, I explain, had assembled for the first annual International Elvis Presley Impersonator Conference, an intimate gathering of 200-plus actors from around the globe. They were taking over the place, a nuisance, like the crawl of mucus congestion in someone who's also dying. Each one had committed their life to the same dozen or so singles crooned by the late king of rock and roll. Most of the songs you'll remember from Lilo and Stitch, I say, though she's never seen the film. I'll stop there. Really? You want me to keep going? <laughs> Maybe a little Yeah, a little bit. Okay. More, yeah. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't believe how many ways there are to impersonate the same person. All these short men wearing platform shoes, tall men crouching and stooping their shoulders to make themselves smaller. They all had his slick back quiff, so black and gelled, almost le- wet looking. It was hard to look at them for a long time without wanting to kill myself. Someone toys with the stereo, spilling a coil of fuzzy sound through the dank hall. Yeah, so you needed to hear that next paragraph, right? <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, so um, talk about how this, how it was to write this story compared mm. to the others in the collection. Yeah, I think it was a different experience. I think with this story, I was excited to explore this idea, not only of a crew of Elvis Presley impersonators slowly taking over the hotel, but also kind of following this sort of formal interest I had in just layering a story within a story within a story. And there there was this a playfulness that I was able to access in writing this story that I think that I didn't necessarily access in some of the other ones. Um, and I felt like I was able to really write very freely, if that makes sense. I I think when I'm thinking back on writing this story, um, I tend to write really fast, messy first drafts, um, and they're always overwritten, and and they always, yeah, they're always a little messy. But I I think with this story, there was such a, a pleasure in kind of following the these two girls, their conversation, um, writing into the dialogue, I think dialogue is something that I honestly kind of struggle writing sometimes and and it was a good exercise in in writing dialogue and letting the characters really very truthfully speak for themselves and just go down these fun little rabbit holes that Mm. I think, you know, it didn't feel as, again, tightly controlled. Yeah. Mm. And what was the kernel for this story? Um, I think so it was actually it was Elvis it was this idea of you know his presence in Hawaii there's a section um, later in the story that I had come across from a little write-up in the Star Bulletin and I don't even remember the year but it was something that he had written um, in our in our newspaper and it was just this long stream of like here's all the things I love about Hawaii and like you know being here and that sort of thing and I I used to work I used to work in PR and one of our clients was this this tribute show and it was a Michael Jackson and Elvis Presley tribute show in the heart of Waikiki um and I used to have to go to these shows again and again and again and I hated them and I just I couldn't really it was such an interesting idea for me to sort of right into this especially the elvis fascination thinking about his his history in the islands as well mm. yeah yeah so so this <laughs> is the way of processing that, i guess that yeah <laughs> all those five all years those of yeah, yeah no. wow. um okay so i want to shift slightly it's going to be my last couple of questions and i want to hand it over to you all um i want to talk about your sentences mm. um so this doesn't happen that often, even with writing writers that I really love. Um, I'm not often that surprised by a sentence. I'm not saying I'm jaded or anything like that. But <laughs> what was really interesting about reading your book, Megan, was that, and I've said this to people before, I said, oh, I'm reading this book and blah, 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 blah. I'm, you know, I haven't read anything of this author before. And people will, will ask me what I, how I was finding it. And I said, and I 
more than anything, I would just say the sentences are really surprising. Mm -hmm. And so by that, I mean, they don't go where I expect them to go. And, um, and I'll just read a couple of examples, if you will indulge me. One of them is, um, okay, this one's going to be really short. This is from Story of Men. Um, most of us had lost interest in men at that point. Only girl two persisted. Fascination boiling in both thumbs. Um, this is from Mad Women. The son I bore prances through the house like a stotting gazelle, weaving around tables, desks, floor lamps, chairs, stools, swelling the space with the charisma uniquely possessed by a six going on seven year old. And then the last one I'll read is, um, oh, uh, oh yes, my great aunt, my great aunt Judy was arrest. Oh, this is from Hotel Molokai. My great aunt Judy was arrestingly handsome, gammon and build, with a sharp vulpine face. She wore a proud Kanaka tan and was difficult to look at in one sweep. You see what I mean, right? <laughs> so, um, so. You mentioned that when you write, your process is to write a fast, messy first draft. So do these sentences, these strange, wonderful sentences appear in those first drafts or do you go back and they kind of rise up through tinkering and excavating or do they just kind of burst out like that? I think there's a, there's a, there's a piece of them or, or something like that in that first writing of the draft, but it's also always off, always not really hitting that mark. Um, a lot of it, I mentioned overwriting. Um, that's something I'm kind of always pulling back, especially in, in revision mm -hmm. um, because of this, so my awareness of my process of just very quick first drafts. So much of the really meaningful work I think that happens in the in writing these stories um, it happened during revision and sort of really spending time with the stories and with the language so I think in that first draft I have a lot of these sentences that I that I feel very excited about um, and I I, la I kind of latch on to that excitement um, mm. so I try to take a lot of pleasure in writing sentences that excite me or surprise me um in that first draft process but there's always there's always tweaking that needs to happen too mm -hmm. so um in order to get them to the place where i feel like okay to share them i guess mm -hmm. in with, with others um i i work on that a lot in it when i return to it for revisions yeah yeah and and the reason why i think they're so effective is not because they are cleverly constructed and beautiful blah 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 I think beauty is really overrated mm -hmm. in writing but I think it's because the how specifically um destabilizing they are in yeah. the way that through those kind of senses you're able to see how someone else sees another person or their or how they feel about themselves even indirectly and so yeah. I think it's those are really great character moments um for me reading them um, so I want to finish with just asking, just sort of opening it back out mm -hmm. again. Um, who uh, You talked a bit about some of the writers that you admire, that you're influenced by. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you could just say a little bit about, um, about wh who, which writers or, um, or genres or however you, you want to think about this that you feel like your writing's in conversation with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I think a lot about first you know works that are also written by Native Hawaiian writers, as a lot of the books that I was sort of absorbing and taking in while I was trying to figure out how to write these stories responsibly and how to write them truthfully. And Christiana Kahakawila was a huge source of inspiration for me, especially her collection, This Is Paradise. Um, and especially as a another Kanaka woman who is interested in writing short fiction, um, the way that she handles this, the topic of home and family and doing right by family but also 
not making the work any smaller or uh, flattening it for a, a wide audience. I think I, I was really inspired by that and by her work. Um, Kiana Davenport is another um, Native Hawaiian writer that I absolutely love and studying her novels has been a true joy as I try to figure out how to write a novel. Um, and, you know, looking at kind of sentences and, and short fiction as well, um, I absolutely love Joy Williams. I think we talked about Joy Williams briefly, but I am very much a Joy Williams fan and sort of the way that she uh, curates her sentences and especially how they kind of brush up against each other, uh, creating tension, creating a, you know, a sense of cohesion, all sorts of things. I think she's a master. And, um, and also just the playfulness of certain writing and certain authors uh, writing into sort of speculative fiction. I absolutely love Kelly Link and all of her work. Um, Karen Russell is another favorite of mine, longtime favorite of mine. And yeah, I, I could keep going, but I, right. I don't, yeah. Right. <laughs> Well, thank you so yeah. much. I want to hand it over to you all. Mm -hmm. So if you have a question, then um, please raise your hand. I'm going to yeah. walk on to the mic so you can hear me better. Fine. Hi. I, um, I think it is like, it is like really impressive trying to be responsible and telling like very big and old stories. I don't know if I'm using a mic correctly. Anyway, yeah, it it's, it's it's very impressive. I haven't gotten to read it all. I'm sure you did a great job. Do you ever like <laughs> have a desire to be responsible with your own stories? I don't. I don't want to ask like a crass question, but just as like you, you do have like a playful side. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if you ever just want to do that. If you like resist doing it, or do you let yourself do it? And it's just different. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I I think that's definitely a part of it. I think, you know writing the stories of our mo'olelo and our Hawaiian culture, I think I'm very much aware of, honestly, so many different pressures. And I don't necessarily, I don't think I've ever felt like I wanted to, to write them irresponsibly. I think maybe topics that don't feel so big to me or feel like things that I'm like excited to explore or just, you know, write one of the stories in this collection is about like bikini waxing and this idea of like exchanging a personality trait in order to get like a single free wax. And I don't know if it's, you know, irresponsibly written, you know, I don't think that maybe it's that, but I think just this, this urge toward playfulness, I, I like to follow that. And I like to follow that in fiction. Um, I feel like I don't have a, a strong, like a palette for just like only serious writing or only, you know, writing that's, that's, pushing something forth. I think there's, I, I appreciate and want to kind of just follow those impulses and to be playful and, and sort of, yeah, mess around and see what happens. Yeah. Um, hi. Hi. Um, <laughs> I am thinking about what you said about like being loose when you write and like mm -hmm. seeing where the story goes. Was there a story that like surprised you in how it ended up? And if yes, can you talk about that a little? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I I think one of the stories that I felt loosest with when writing was the story called Mad Woman. And that was about sort of, I, I feel like when I was writing it, I threw all of my anxieties around motherhood and raising a child and having a child in this world and what that looks like and I really kind of wrote into the fear in that story especially so I had no clear trajectory of where that story was going and it it, it ends I don't want to spoil anything it's not really a spoiler but it just end it ended in a way that I wasn't expecting it to end um and I honest I feel like endings are really hard especially to write um but so many of the endings that in stories that I love reading feel like very, very unexpected. Um, and for me, that story kind of hid that because I, I think 
I was trying really hard not to try and like project a certain narrative onto this this mother character um the protagonist and I yeah I was very surprised when it ended and I don't think that has happened for me for a lot of stories like I think that that moment of surprise is like a gift because I don't think it always happens when you're writing fiction at least it hasn't for me um so yeah that stands out to me yeah They're so hard. You can't kind of throw yourself a surprise party. <laughs> to force it, yeah. Um, I just mentioned, I always quote this. It's, we have Shri, sorry, we have um, wonderful, one of my favorite writers, Sruti Swami, in the audience. And on a short story panel, the question of endings came up. And Sruti, you said something that I always quote, um, which is that you tend to stop where it seems oh it, when you think about ending do you think about where the most interesting place to stop would be mm. and i thought yeah i love that i love that yeah. i'm gonna i'm gonna steal that for my own <laughs> writing but credit it to shruti swami so yeah i mean it's a good yeah that's a good benchmark and so many yeah. freaking stories that i don't have no idea how to when i'm going into it how yeah. it's going to end or what makes the story you know so mm like amnesia in I know. a way, right? Um, okay, so I'm going to give this back to the audience. Thank you. Um, I think earlier you had said, hi, hi. I think earlier you had said that you hadn't written stories that took place in Hawaii before this, mm -hmm. question mark. Um, and I'm just wondering what's it how has this process kind of shaped, did it shape your relationship to Hawaii, to your kanaka nests, and what was that like? Yeah, that's a great question. It's, it's a very long answer, I think, but I'll try to, <laughs> I think it's constantly changing too, and I think it's always evolving. Um, uh, so yeah, starting with Temporary Dwellers, so you know, taking it as like the first story uh, that I had just set tried to set um in our homeland um looking at it was so much stress <laughs> and a lot of just anxiety around not so much on the public page like not so much oh how will everyone read this story how will that be read it was it was very much centered around Hawaiian readers and family readers um this sense of really needing to do right by our community and I kept that story to myself for a really long time but the process of writing not only that story but all of the stories in the collection involved having a lot of conversations with family and uh returning to books that my grams who's on on, on my Hawaiian side of my family from Molokai um returning to books that she had gifted me um, when I was just a kid. And there was a lot, is emotional. <laughs> um, there was a lot of, of reconnecting and a lot of really cultivating such a deep appreciation that, you know, we don't, I didn't always have um, growing up. And I think, you know, thinking about what we were talking about in terms of writing um, in a place versus having that distance, I think, just also a lot of creative distance that went into it and needing to take that space away from being home in order to cultivate those feelings of gratitude and and to access these stories at a deeper level I think was really important and but I, but yeah I think it's also always evolving where I am very attuned to wanting to do right by Kanaka readers and in the process of putting this book out, just having, um, finding native Hawaiian readers in every state that I've been able to visit and having a dialogue with them. And that has on it, that has been one of the most special experiences. And I, I, I truly like, I can't overstate how, how important and how grateful I am for that. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, I would love to hear about the process of forming this collection. I'm curious if sort of these like stories were written without the intention of it going into a collection. Some were written expressly with the intention of them, of them going in and kind of um, how it took shape as a whole as well. Definitely. I love talking about like process of collections and stuff like that. I think they're really hard and also really fun. And um, I will also say again that I had an incredible agent, Eva Lenny. I still have like, an incredible agent and we worked very closely together to conceive of all like this mishmash of that felt like to me like a mishmash of stories and trying to figure out, okay, what would this look like in a, in a book? And um, I, I believe uh, only one or two of the stories in the collection were written after we had um, started working together and, and were intending to turn it into a book. Um, the majority of the stories I had been working on and thinking about sending off to places and, you know, trying to get them published. Um, but, you know, we, we thought a lot about, she, she really helped me see the way that stories speak to each other um, and how the way you end, like the way you, how one story ends and the next begins can create so many different, that it can have so many different effects, you know, and thinking about um, what effect I wanted or imagined having in my ideal reader. Um, we also, I knew from when we started working together that I had wanted um, the story Every Drop is a Man's Nightmare to kind of kick off the collection as this idea of, you know, moving through adolescence into sort of young adulthood and womanhood and ending the collection with the story titled uh, The Love and Decline of the Corpse Flower, which is sort of centers two women at the end of their lives. Um, and I had no idea what I wanted the rest of the collection to look like. And so a lot of that work was done with Ivalani thinking about the way those stories were working together and also starting the collection with, I like the idea of starting it with sort of that list that you all read so beautifully. Um, we, I liked that kind of effect, this idea of beginning with also like a list of negations and just moving straight into a story that completely defies like one of the top, um, you know, things that uh, the the mother was saying not to do basically. And yeah, I, I think there was a lot of wonderful guidance that I received from, from working with Eva Lenny and also just looking at the stories, trying as much as possible to look at them from a distance and see how they were speaking with each other. Yeah. Hi. Um, Hi. How do you know? So you talked about having a process where you put it out all on the page, sort of mm -hmm. let it go where it will, and then you take a lot of time revising and scaling yeah. back. I'm wondering how you know when to stop revising. This is a personal problem as well. <laughs> That's a personal problem of mine, too. Um, I started to. So, okay, I guess I started to pay really close attention to the kind of work that I was doing in that process. Um, for me, revision often in the beginning means rewriting. So I will tend to write several versions of the same story or several drafts from beginning to end. Um, and then I like to kind of get into the weeds of the language a little bit. Um, and in trying to sort of be a more attentive writer, I really att at really attend to kind of it on the language level. I had to really pay attention to, you know, I, I tend to write like three adjectives when there only needs to be one or just like trying to find that right verb. And um, I try as much as possible to let those, to make those decisions, take the, you know, take as long as it takes sort of thing. Um, but when I was really just changing out verbs, I was noticing all of the time or, or trying to pick up on those cues when I'm changing out a verb like 10 different times and then I just go back to the same one. Um, I will kind of make a note to myself that maybe I'm getting a little, you know, a little too much into it because I think a lot of that is also fear in, in not knowing 
is this is this the truest version of itself is this the thing that you know I am going to be the most proud of um I think I'm also still trying to figure it out but um at least paying attention to what what kind of work I am doing in the revision and if it is really moving the story forward um or if it's me giving into the fear a little bit and and staying yeah into the piece I don't know if that answered your question very well honestly because I'm also still figuring it out I know a few <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's uh, yeah. yeah. I just sometimes I just let my own stop and I'm just waiting for the, my editorial agent to say Yeah. Yeah. Or a deadline actually. Deadline. Deadlines yeah. help a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Cuz then I can't. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Any more? We have time for maybe one, maybe two. Yeah. Hi. Um, you mentioned writing into your obsessions um, earlier, and I'm curious, what is one or a few obsessions that you feel like you've kind of like satisfied with this collection, and what's one that you feel like there's a lot more room to explore? Good question. Hard question. Can an I, <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> I, yeah, no, I don't, I don't know if it's, yeah. Have you written you know what that's a good I was literally just gonna say I'm like I feel like I might be the kind of writer that just circles the same exact things I might be done with Elvis <laughs> but like I'm not done with bikini waxing I don't know I I do think for a set like maybe Elvis um but I at the same time I honestly do maybe think of myself as the kind of person that is circling the same things often um I'm working on a novel right now and a lot of the sort of these ideas of of menstruation and the wounds of colonization um family <laughs> a lot of these things are very present in the novel um and I don't feel like I get really tired of writing them I feel like there's maybe maybe because I'm still, you know, or trying to figure out what it is I'm writing and, and sort of where I fit and where these stories belong. Um, but I sense that there's a lot of things, even in these stories, that I will want to kind of push on a little more. I, I feel like the best obsessions, yeah, are, are ones that, like, demand to be prodded from different angles and, and perspectives um yeah any last questions before we get to the signing one more round of thank applause thank you please. all so much thank you